Hi fellow bibliophiles and welcome back to Blatantly Bookish. So earlier this month I finished the book Jane Austen The Secret Radical by Helena Kelly and I cannot wait to talk to you guys all about it and about Jane Austen in general and biographical readings and literary criticism and a whole bunch of semi-related things and subversive readings of Austen's texts. But before I go rambling about biographical readings and literary criticism, I want to talk about the book in general. Jane Austen, The Secret Radical is many, many things. It's part biography, part fiction, and part literary criticism. There's an introductory chapter and a concluding chapter, but other than that, each section of the book focuses on one of Jane's six finished novels. Each section starts with a fictional page or two of Kelly's own musings into the inner workings of Jane Austen's mind, based on her letters. Then Kelly delves into subversive or radical readings of Austen's texts, providing both historical and biographic details to support her claims. Kelly contextualizes Jane historically, stating that she lived in a time of great revolution, notably the American and French revolutions. And she states that ideas that went against the status quo, like a female author, were shunned and seen as dangerous. Treason was then redefined to include writing, thinking, and reading. Kelly pushes against the idea that Austen's books are romances and continues to argue that Austen was essentially writing in a totalitarian government. And that subtext is the key to understanding her works because Austen's true opinions are carefully veiled. She takes the most extreme, most subversive approaches to Austen's works and pushes back on conventional readings. But in my opinion, many of the nuances of her points are entirely unfounded, and Kelly generally misses what was truly so radical about Austen's work. I agree that there are many layers to Austen's works, and that viewing them as simple romances is certainly reductive, uh, though I'd argue that whatever Austen's thoughts and motives may be, she's contributed to many of the classic romantic archetypes in popular culture, and I don't think that can be ignored. This book made me extremely angry, and yet was such a delightful reading experience. I was really suspicious of what Kelly had to say, and the book just rekindled my love for Austen and left me with the overall feeling that I just need to reread all of her books, or in the case of Mansfield Park, actually read the book in the first place. Sometimes, though, you just revel in reading and disagreeing with or questioning literary criticism. It really strengthens your own ideas and thoughts during the reading process, and it becomes a very active and engaging type of reading. One of my major critiques of this book was very simply the concept of radical. Believe it or not, Helena Kelly never defined the word radical and what it meant in the context of Jane Austen's works. But based on reading Jane Austen, The Secret Radical, I can begin to define Kelly's version of radical for us. She sees Austen as radical in what she writes, and in that she critiques institutions that were accepted at the time, namely the church, the aristocracy, military, slavery. As much as the modern reader may want to attribute all of this to Austen's works, I believe that Kelly reads subtext in Austen's writing that just simply isn't there. Sometimes the evidence she gives is literally a quote that has been misread or misinterpreted. For example, she paints Lizzie as this incredibly transgressive character, stating that she doesn't respect authority and even criticizes her father for poor parenting and incompetency. Yet the quote she uses to back this up is actually about Lizzie criticizing her father in the way that he handles the whole situation with Lydia. The entirety of the quote actually reads, Excuse me, for I must speak plainly. If you, my dear father, will not take the trouble of checking her exuberant spirits and of teaching her that her present pursuits are not to be the business of her life, she will soon be beyond the reach of amendment. Her character will be fixed, and she will, at sixteen, be the most determined flirt that ever made herself and her family ridiculous. A flirt, too, in the worst and meanest degree of flirtation, without any attraction beyond youth and a tolerable person, and from the ignorance and emptiness of her mind, wholly unable to ward off any portion of that universal contempt which her rage for admiration will excite. In this danger, Kitty is also comprehended. She will follow wherever Lydia leads. 
vain, ignorant, idle, and absolutely uncontrolled. Oh, my dear father, can you suppose it possible that they will not be censured and despised wherever they are known, and that their sisters will not be often involved in the disgrace? So Kelly's argument stopped at, excuse me, for I must speak plainly. But when we take the quote as a whole, this isn't really particularly transgressive of Lizzie at all. Lydia running off with Wickham is the truly scandalous and transgressive act for the time. And Lizzie is criticizing her father for not doing more to stop Lydia's actions and to form her into a more respectable person. Now, I'm familiar enough with Pride and Prejudice to figure this one out. And I can't remember, but Katie from Books and Things may have helped me with this one. But this is what I mean by how Kelly infuriated me. Her arguments have the tendency to sound really convincing. That is, until you actually go back to the source material. There are misleading moments like this in her work. So what else has misled me that I missed? This is an example of someone who is trying to make Lizzie Bennet more progressive and more modern thinking than she actually is, and letting our modern minds and the love of Austen dictate how we read a character. Katie from Books and Things, who I talked extensively about my thoughts with this book, she talks about this idea a lot in a wonderful video that I will link below for you. You should definitely check it out. I don't disagree with Kelly that Austen was a radical author, though. However, I believe what was so radical about her was less about the themes and characters' thoughts that she wrote, and more about how she wrote them. I haven't read too much before Jane Austen's time, but she seems to have more in common with later Victorian authors than her predecessors. Her works, to me, are a major turning point in the rise of the novel. Her heroines are so much richer and more complex than previous characters. I mean, compare Emma to Defoe's Roxana, or Lizzie Bennet to Richardson's Pamela. The difference is simply astounding. In part, what gives Austen such a radical edge to her work is her use of free indirect discourse, which gives her the ability to convey a character's voice as mediated by the narrator or author. So it's technically third person, not first person writing, but the characters have the ability to shine through a little more than strict third person writing. Though Kelly doesn't mention Austen's style as radical whatsoever. Her fictional forwards to each chapter were also very distracting for me, and I felt that they undermined her arguments even further. It's hard to take what comes next as serious literary criticism when it's preceded by complete speculation on snippets of Jane's correspondences. It's also hard to take Kelly seriously when much of her readings, especially regarding persuasion, are biographical in nature. I thought persuasion was perhaps Kelly's weakest chapter. She discusses persuasion as a book of decay and instability, loss, destruction, and change. She argues, how can you rely on a tradition and order and identity when the whole world is mutable, when dynasties crumble and your deepest beliefs may be based on fiction? This isn't a particularly unique way of reading persuasion, in my opinion, nor particularly radical. She discusses Bath's foreign architecture as the past and present colliding, the new being built right on top of the old. And if it slid into ruins, what is to prevent their current society from sliding into ruins as well? I think that's one way of reading Bath's architecture, but I think another is that the Roman ruins are actually preserved in the new construction of Bath, and that they are literally the foundation for the present. Even worse than a pretty traditional reading of Persuasion, in my opinion, is that biographical reading that Kelly attributes to Persuasion. She discusses Jane's personal experiences in Bath and how she associates Bath with the death of her friend Anne Lefroy and experiences with her father's death as well. She points to many of the dates on the first page of Persuasion and shows how there are significant dates in Jane's life, which I'm not disputing, but she goes as far as to explain that some people read Anne Elliot as an autobiographical version of Jane. I personally have a lot of issues with biographical readings. 
While I think it's interesting to know some biographical facts about the author and about history in general so you can accurately root yourself in the time period, I think there's a lot more to be said from your interaction and interpretation of the book than from the author's. This is kind of complicated, though, when reading old books, books written in Victorian times or the Regency era, though, because as modern readers, we bring so much of our own time period to the text. There will likely be some things that we read into texts that simply disagree with the time period. For example, I feel like a lot of modern day readers would find Darcy's behavior at the ball to be shy and socially awkward in an almost endearing way. but. He's actually just being stuck up, and his behavior has to do with class. A Victorian or a Georgian reader would pick this up easily, but unless we know a lot about the time period, we as modern readers are pretty likely to miss it. I don't think this is a bad thing, but it makes me really interested in learning about history, which is great. And one of the reasons I love Victorian literature so much, and Jane Austen's literature so much, which isn't Victorian, is that I can come to a book from so many different angles. Reading it from a modern perspective, thinking about how people at the time would have perceived it, and sort of analyzing it from a multitude of perspectives. It just makes it so much fun to read. Now, I know I've hated on this book a lot, and it sounds like I actually hated the book itself, but I didn't. I actually found a few of Kelly's readings pretty intriguing and worthwhile. The first chapter about Northanger Abbey was my absolute favorite. Kelly illuminates the mysteries of Rudolfo, references that were lost on me as a reader because I haven't read the mysteries of Rudolfo, and I'm kind of worried that Kelly is misinterpreting things again, but apparently if you're familiar with the mysteries of Rudolfo, you'll be able to figure out that Catherine hasn't even finished that book. I've always thought of Northanger Abbey as a book that supports the merits of the novel. But Kelly's reading takes that concept to a different level. She posits that the Gothic isn't to blame in Northanger Abbey, because Catherine isn't even too familiar with the Gothic, but rather the ideas that lead Catherine astray are from similar themes found in history, drama, Shakespeare, other things that Catherine is familiar with. There's another compelling argument that Kathy makes that the mystery or the secret of Northanger Abbey is that childbirth and pregnancy kills, and that even though General Tilney did not kill his wife in the gothic horror way that Catherine presumes, the reality of sex and pregnancy in the time period is even more terrifying than the gothic notion of murder and poison. That may seem like a pretty big leap, but I think Kelly actually does a decent job of backing this claim up as far as I'm aware. And I like the idea of reading Northanger Abbey where reality is more terrifying than the gothic. Much of the gothic genre is actually a different way to manifest fears about reality after all, so I think this reading actually really fits. There was also an interesting reading in the Sense and Sensibility chapter of money and inheritance as a system that erodes fairness and family affections. She discusses how metal is slang for money, and that metal in Jane Austen's novels is a means of exchange. Jewelry plays a prominent role in Sense and Sensibility. And there are plenty of references to guns, knives, scissors, needles, and pins, all metal, in Austen's works. And metal or money, Kelly argues, can be seen as a weapon, reward, or a threat. I feel like this is a really interesting reading, though Kelly doesn't do the best job of connecting it to her interpretation of the rest of Sense and Sensibility. I think that it's an interesting theme to explore and to think about in Austen's works. I also think that Kelly has an interesting take on the way class is turned on its head in Emma. Knightley, who is a respectable landowner, is described at one point as dressing like a farmer, going on foot, not having horses for his carriage. Emma's class is an interesting question since her father is untitled, yet the family is very rich. And though Emma is rich, she is intimate friends with Harriet, who has no respectable background to speak of. There's this idea of social malleability in Emma that Harriet, though a nobody, could marry anyone from a farmer like Robert Martin to Mr. Knightley. Not to mention there's Jane Fairfax and Frank Churchill, both adopted children. In Emma, there seems to be this idea that not having a respectable background, being orphaned or disconnected from family ties is not an impediment for social mobility, but rather functions as a blank slate with which to make something of oneself. I feel like this type of social mobility, though, is a concept that has much more in common with later works, Victorian works, and Dickens, for example. 
than when Austen was writing. Of course, I was far less fond of some of Kelly's readings, like Darcy's and Lizzie's marriage as the perfect marriage, and that Pride and Prejudice has a fairy tale ending. She actually used the word fairy tale. And my least favorite reading of Kelly's was her take on Emma. She read the entirety of the book as a statement against enclosure practices and undermining Mr. Knightley's motives and affections for Emma. For those of you who aren't aware of enclosure, it was a movement that really kicked off between 1795 and 1815 to shut off access to common land that non-land owners had previously used to fish, forage, find firewood, etc. The idea behind enclosure was that the population was growing and it wasn't feasible anymore for the land to support everyone like it used to. So instead it was divided up and distributed according to people's common rights. In reality, Kelly says that it actually halved the income of laboring families and caused the landowner to actually pay more in poor rates or poor taxes. Now, all this information comes directly from the book, so if it's not accurate and you understand enclosure better than both me and Kelly, please, please let me know. But Kelly basically posits that Mr. Knightley's driving motive and interest in Emma is to seal enclosure deals and basically obtain Hartfield for its enclosure votes in the town. Maybe enclosure is in the background of Emma, but to read the whole text as a commentary of enclosure seems pretty extreme to me. One of my favorite parts of this book, though, was the last line. Simply three words. Read them again. And that's exactly what this book made me want to do. It made me want to reread all of Jane Austen's work, or in the case of Mansfield Park, actually read it for the first time. And it made me want to keep thinking and keep discovering new things in Austen's texts. But it also made me want to do something else, which was read more literary criticism, which I don't actually do too much of. I think literary criticism has this power to fuel this excitement and deeper engagement with texts. So I have some Austen criticism here that I haven't read yet. The first one is What Matters in Jane Austen? 20 Crucial Puzzles Solved by John Mullen. And John Mullen is a prominent Austen scholar, so I really, really want to hear what he has to say about Austen's work. And I also have Jane's Fame, which, uh, sorry, How Jane Austen Conquered the World by Claire Harmon. Now, this one I think is less serious literary criticism and a little more about Austen's legacy and how she's perceived in society. Still, it should be interesting. And the last one I have for you is Jane Austen's England, Daily Life in the Georgian and Regency Periods by Roy and Leslie Adkins. And I think this one would be really good in getting some historical context about the time period in which Jane Austen is writing about. It might help me to see some of these little historical details in her works and to better interpret what I'm reading. So I probably should have said I don't have some literary criticism for you. I probably should have said I have some nonfiction about Jane Austen for you because only one of those books was strictly literary criticism, but oh well. But how do you feel about literary criticism? Have you read any good criticism lately? And I don't just mean about Austen. It could be about any work. Do you have suggestions about good literary criticism? Because I feel like the main reason I don't read more literary criticism is because I'm just not aware of it. I'm not currently in an academic setting and I don't have people to recommend any to me. So it really, it doesn't have to be about Austin, but I'd be interested in hearing if you guys have any recommendations for me. So I hope you enjoyed that really, really long rant on Jane Austen and Jane Austen and the Secret Radical, and a whole bunch of other things. And please let me know in the comments down below what you think of anything and everything that I said. And until next time, I look forward to seeing you in another video soon. Bye! And if you stay